everyone my name is Kira and welcome or welcome back to my YouTube channel as you can tell we have new lighting using my new ring light my intro is different got copyrighted and we also got a change of backdrop so today's video is gonna be something a little different I put up a poll on my Facebook and my Instagram and asked you guys if you'd like to see me talk about a true crime case and most of the votes were yes so that's what we're gonna do today also, it is storming, so if you hear some noise, it's thunder and rain. So, I just wanted to put a little bit of a trigger warning in this video. Today's video is going to be really heavy, and if you are easily triggered, I'm going to be kind of going into depth about this case. So, if you're not big on that, if you get triggered easy, I'm sorry, but just go ahead and click off. But I really wanted to talk about this case because it is a case that I have never heard of, ever. I also searched on YouTube a little bit to see if there were some videos out about it and there wasn't really much. Today we are going to be talking about the Freeway Phantom. Retired DC detective Romaine Jenkins doesn't remember many cases from her four years in the homicide unit. This was back in the late 1960s and 70s when the homicide unit was overcrowded with murders. She was in her 20s and the first female in the homicide unit. But she does remember the slayings of six black girls ages 10 through 18 who were snatched from DC streets, strangled and discarded on heavily traveled roadways. These killings are believed to be the first serial killings in Washington, DC. The murders stopped 17 months after they started. With the exception of Jenkins and another detective, no one other than the victim's family seemed to care. May 1st, 1971. Some children were playing in a grassy area along I-295 behind St. Elizabeth's Hospital when they found the body of a young girl. Her name was Carol Spinks. She was a seventh grader at Johnson Junior High School. She was an identical twin. She loved double dutch jump roping, playing jacks, and hula hooping. She was abducted six days earlier after walking to a 7-Eleven. Her older sister had given her money to go pick up some items even though their mother told them not to leave. Along the way there, her mother spotted her and told her to go straight home after she picked up the items, but she never made it home. Soon after, her mother filed a report and everyone started searching. When she was found, she had been strangled. She had cuts to her chest, neck, face, and hands. Her shoes were missing, and they also found green synthetic fibers on her clothing. They found citrus in her stomach, so they believe that her killer fed her, but she had been deceased two to three days before she was found. I have like so many notes here, so I make sure that I get everything correct. 10 weeks later, a second girl was found by a DC Department of Highway and Traffic employee. He had car trouble and pulled off to the side of the road. When he pulled over, he found the girl. That was the second call that day about the same discovery. Officers didn't get out, quote, they just drove by. July 19th, a week later, one of the callers returned to the site to find the body still there. The caller called his boss, who then called DC Sergeant Charles Baden. He was off duty that day, but drove to the scene just north of the Bowling Air Force Base. Quote, I asked him if he called the police. He said, yeah, but nobody came. The body was found just 15 feet from where Spink's remains were found. Her name was Starlena Johnson and she was 16 years old. She had been reported missing on July 9th, a day after telling her mother she was going to work at the Oxen Run Recreation Center. Johnson said she was going to a sleepover the center was having for the kids and never showed up. Found 11 days later, she was so badly decomposed they had to cut off her finger to identify her. What? Back then, they didn't have DNA testing. They only had fingerprinting, but why did they have to cut it off? It could not be determined how she died. Nine days after finding Johnson, a hitchhiker found another body on Route 50 in Cheverly just across District Line. She was Brenda Faye Crockett, a dimpled 10-year-old girl who had tons of friends, loved choosing for a camera, and going to church. She was found along the road like the other victims. She had been strangled, and they also found the same synthetic green fibers on her clothing. She left the house barefoot with pink curlers in her hair. She ran to the local Safeway to get bread and pet food. 
Her mother sent her out around 8 p.m. When she didn't return for an hour, her mother went looking, and her only sister, seven years old, stayed with her mother's boyfriend. A phone call came in at 9.20 p.m. It was Brenda. She told her sister a white man, quote, snatched her up and took her somewhere in Virginia, but was sending her back by taxi. Brenda called 25 minutes later and talked to her mother's boyfriend. He asked if she knew where she was. No, she said, quote, did my mother see me? He asked, how could your mother see you if you're somewhere in Virginia? The boyfriend asked to speak to the man, quote, well, I'll see you, she whispered before ending the call. She was found less than eight hours later, feet pristine like they'd been washed. There is a theory that the killer knew her mother and that's why she asked if she had been seen with him. Quote, why would he let her call home not once, but twice? On October 1st, 1971, Nina Moshe Yates vanished. She was 12 years old. She had gone to the Safeway a block from her house to pick up some items. Her stepmother had just had a baby, so her father had to be at the hospital. She disappeared on her way home. A 16-year-old found her two hours later, still warm, along Pennsylvania Avenue. She was found strangled with the same green fibers found on her clothing. This is when the press connected the killings and dubbed the killer the Freeway Phantom. I hate when the press gives killers names like this. It just gives them attention and it gives them, you know, pumps them up. Police now too thought it was a serial killer. Six weeks later, the fifth victim was found. Her name was Brenda Woodard and she was 18 years old. She went missing on November 15th after going to Ben's Chili Bowl with a classmate. The classmate usually drove her home, but his car was in the shop, so they took the bus. When she was found, Woodard's burgundy crushed velvet coat was draped over her body. Her turtleneck was inside out and buttons were missing from her skirt and her coat. She was raped, strangled, and stabbed four times. Defense wounds show that she tried to fight back. A note was stuffed in her coat pocket. The note read, and I quote, This is a tantamount to my insensitivity towards people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Authorities were certain that she wrote the note forced to by her killer. There were no signs of nervousness in her handwriting, so the police were led to believe that she knew her killer. Ten months had passed, leading detectives to believe that the killer had been convicted of other crimes or moved out of the area. On September 6th, 1972, Diane Williams, who was 17 years old, was found by a trucker who had pulled off to the side of the road. She was a junior at Ballow Senior High School. She had spent the evening with her boyfriend who walked her to the bus stop for her trip home. She had been strangled and left along I-295, about 200 yards south of the DC line. Diane was written on one of her white sneakers and a dollar and 26 cents was found in one of her pockets. In 1974, the FBI set up a task force to investigate. They developed hundreds of suspects and ran down every lead. They questioned a man who owned a nightclub where Darlena Johnson hung out and also a man who allegedly was seen with Johnson after she was reported missing. They were eventually cleared. The strongest suspect they had was Robert Askins. He was a computer technician and a former patient at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. He had also served time for the 1938 poisoning death of a prostitute. He was freed in 1958 after his sentence was overturned due to a technicality. There's so much of this technicality bullshit. In March 1977, the police obtained a search warrant to search his home. They found court documents from his conviction in which he used the word tantamount, the same word found in the note written by one of the victims. Quote, Askins is known to use the word when stressing the importance of matters related to his work. They also found soiled women's scarves, photos of young women and girls, a knife used in another crime and an essay from a girl. Another warrant was issued a month later to search his vehicle. They found two buttons and a gold earring underneath his back seat. Seems like a case closed, huh? No. They didn't have evidence to link him to the six girls. The green fibers didn't match anything found and his hair tests came back negative as well. He was eventually convicted of kidnapping and raping two women in the area several years later and received a life sentence. 
He died in prison on April 30th of 2010 at 91 years old. Jenkins, our detective from before, doesn't believe that he did it. She believes that the killer may have been a military veteran. He might have served in the Vietnam War or had PTSD or some reason to be angry at police. She believes he is in his 20s or 30s and a black male. Askins was black, but he was 52 at the time. An FBI crime analyst says that the killer has at least a high school education or above and average or above average intelligence. They believe that he was employed. He was able to have conversations with women, but not healthy relationships. He was believed to have lived alone or with an older woman. And he also knew the neighborhoods. Jenkins, in 1979, she ran across a file called Green Vega. There were two men convicted of kidnapping and raping women around the DC area at the time. They and three others were said to have drove around in a green Chevrolet Vega. A tipster alleged that the killer was a part of a gang. When questioned, this gang took detectives to the scene, told the story, but it was everything straight out of news stories. They knew nothing about the note and their hairs came back negative. In 1987, the case was reopened. It is reported that Johnson's mother got strange phone calls while her daughter was missing, as well as William's mother also got a phone call saying, quote, I killed your daughter. Jenkins, she's a good, she's a good dude, huh? She went to do DNA testing, which didn't exist back in the 70s. And now, quote, no one knows where the evidence is. Yeah, yeah, take that in. Quote, if those girls had been white, they would have put more manpower into it. There's no doubt about that, says Tommy Musgrove, who joined DC police in 1972 and later headed the homicide unit. The families live with this every day. I just cannot believe that this has never been solved. How did the police lose the evidence? Just like, what? It just broke my heart for these girls. And I just think it's so fitting. I'm not really gonna get into it, but I will leave some links down below, some ways to educate yourself. And that is today's video. I know it was really heavy, but I'm obsessed with true crime. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I really enjoy making these videos. And yeah, if you guys have any requests, anything, you guys want me to do, talk about, let me know. And I'll see you guys next time.